Hi, and welcome back. We're going to be reading The Boy Who Dared by Susan Campbell Bartoletti today. We are picking up on page 98, and we're going to read to page 110. We're starting right here at the page break. The afternoon, the train station is crowded with crying mothers and sweethearts, stoic fathers and children waving red, white, and black flags, an essay band plays, the blare of trumpets and the rat-a-tat of snare drums surround them. Helmuth hates the drums, hates how they quicken his blood, how they belie his true feelings and try to convince him that war is good. Muddy cries as she stands on tiptoe, clings to Gerhard's neck, and Helmuth notices how tiny she is, how her head comes to Gerhard's nose. Gerhard lifts Muddy off the ground, he kisses her, shakes Hugo's hand, and then tells Helmuth to take care of Muddy. Muddy and Oma cling to each other as Gerhard boards the train, one gray infantry soldier among hundreds of gray infantry soldiers. He pushes his way to a window, sticks out his arm, waves, shouts goodbye, his blue eyes bright with danger. The train whistle blows, the wheels turn, Helmuth takes several deep gulps, but he can't breathe as the train pulls away. The band picks up its tempo and Helmuth forgets how he hates the drums. Forgets how angry Gerhard can make him. Remembers only that he loves his brother. Remembers the nights they shared in a bedroom. Muddy, tucking them in. Three brothers. Three dark heads nestled against white pillows. White moonlight shimmering the walls. And suddenly Helmuth is floating. Praying, dear God, dear God, dear God. Keep Gerhard safe. And so prison day 264 passes slowly, the same as every other Tuesday, until five minutes past one o'clock. It is then that Helmuth hears several footsteps outside his cell and the rattle of keys. His heart beats rapidly. He leaps to his feet, stands at attention. Four uniformed prison officials enter his cell. They loom inside the small space, taking up all the air. Two guards accompany the officials, their hands gripping their clubs, ready, always ready. That's what the guards are. Helmuth barks his name. Schutzen Fangener. Hubener. Prisoner Hubener. Even after all these months, Hugo's name, Hubener, feels strange in his mouth. Six pairs of eyes study him. Helmuth Hubener, says one of the men. Helmuth's heart pounds in his ears. He does not know this man, but to hear his name spoken aloud so formally causes his skin to tingle. This is an official visit. He knows important people have written letters on his behalf. People like his attorney and his senior district Hitler youth leader and even Hugo asking for clemency. He is afraid to hope, but he can't stop the hope from beating inside his chest. Helmuth nods. Yes, sir, he answers. His mouth is dry as sand. I am first state attorney, Herr Ronk, the man says, executory leader. He pauses, lets his title sit over Helmuth. The title injects Helmuth with white heat. This is the man who oversees all the executions. Helmuth sways, puts his hand out to the wall to steady himself, to keep himself from melting. Herr Ronk continues, I am appearing by instruction from the attorney general of the people's court. Helmuth straightens himself, stands tall. He looks hair rank in the eye. He doesn't dare breathe, must keep hope from flying out of his chest. He hears Herr Ronk's pocket watch. Tick, tick, tick. Between each tick, a thousand images flash through Helmuth's mind. As thou wilt, as thou wilt, as thou wilt. Late March, 1941. Hamburg is a black pool. Windows along each street are shuttered tight and blackout shades drawn. Not a slice of light anywhere. Behind a darkened window, Helmuth sits at Oma's kitchen table in a small circle of light. The table is strewn with books and papers. He reads, scribbles a few words, stares into space. Helmuth must put the finishing touches on his final paper, his thesis required for graduation. He hates the lies he must write to get a good grade. He wishes he could write what he really thinks of Hitler and the Nazis who shipped his brother off to war. He thinks about the roller radio locked in the closet for safekeeping. He glances at the five o'clock. Five minute. He glances at the clock. Five minutes to ten. He stacks his books, lines up his pencils, shuffles his papers into order, steps softly to his grandparents' bedroom, listens at the closed door to Oma's steady breathing, Opa's light snoring, 
both sound asleep at last. Quietly, ever so quietly, he slips a knife from the kitchen drawer, thrusts it into the hall closet lock, jabs it hard upward once, and Jimmy's open the door. The radio, right where Gerhard left it. Helmuth whistles softly, can't believe his good fortune, and yet he is appalled at his own rashness. He carries the radio gingerly to the kitchen table, turns out the light, sits in the dark, runs his hands over the brown plastic casing. So smooth, so cool to the touch, dare he turn it on? He does. He twists the knob, the radio comes to life, crackling softly, a dim amber light glowing from its face. His fingers tremble. He turns the dial ever so slowly, watches the needle slide, more crackling, and then four clear notes. Da 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 dum. Three short and one long. First four notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the Morse code signal, V for victory. In perfect German, the radio announcer says jauntily, as if he is announcing a tennis match. This is BBC London with the German news broadcast. Helmuth's nerves jangle. His hands shake. It's the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company. Every night, the BBC broadcasts a German-language edition of the news for Germans who dare to break the radio law. He thinks about Gerhard, the way he locked up the radio for safekeeping, told Helmuth to leave it alone, the way he moralized to Helmuth. To break the radio law would be a selfish act. It could endanger our family. Gerhard irritates him all over again. Arresting people for their beliefs is a crime, Helmuth says out loud. Taking away our freedoms is a crime. He leans in closer, chin on his hands. The BBC newscaster is reporting the British losses to the Atlantic. German battleships and submarines operating in the Atlantic sank. 367,800 tons of merchant vessels from March 16th to March 23rd, says the announcer. The Nazis have succeeded in one of the heaviest series of blows yet claimed against British shipping. The Odyssey electrifies Helmuth, the way the British announce their losses to the Germans. At 10.30, the broadcast ends. The announcer urges German listeners to find others to tune in and reminds them to turn the dial so that they won't give themselves away if caught. Helmuth twists the dial, tunes in a Nazi-approved station, then snaps off the radio and stows it back in the closet. Helmuth lies in bed, turning over the differences between the BBC and the RRG. The British disclose actual losses, whereas the RRG never does. It makes the British reporters seem more truthful, more accurate, and that infuriates Helmuth. Don't the Germans have a right to know the whole truth? With great relief, Helmuth finishes his final thesis, turns it in, and on the last day of school, Herr Mines stands in front of the class, gla grasping the graded papers. He pushes his carefully combed gray hair across his forehead. Shiny patches of scalp show, brighter and larger than when the school year began. Helmuth often senses the sadness about Herr Mines. He can't explain it exactly, but there is something about his eyes, their reaction when the class discusses national socialism, as if Herr Mines isn't really a Nazi at heart, but does not dare to say so. I have your final papers here, says Herr Mines, waving the sheath of papers. Helmuth's classmates shift uncontrollably in their seats and tug at their neck collars, eager for dismissal. Herr Mines licks his lips the way he does when he is searching for the exact words that he wants to say. He is never in a hurry to dismiss his students. He always wants to impart one more bit of knowledge before he sends them into the world. Each one of you has a gift, he begins. Something you can offer the fatherland. He looks at their faces as if he can predict what will become of them. And in one sense, he can, since teachers write thorough notations in their students' party record books. The notations will follow them throughout their lives. Some of you are gifted in mathematics, he says. Some in science, some in sports, some in leadership. And yet... As different as each of your gifts is, together you form one body, an intricate part of one machine. The boys fidget, try to keep their eyes from the clock. Herr Mines clears his throat, snapping each squirming boy back to attention. <clears throat> one paper stands out from the rest. It is written by a young man who has the gift of interpretation. He plucks the top paper from the stack. The War of the Plutocrats, he reads. 
Helmuth's face begins to redden. It is his paper. This essay suits the ideals of national socialism, explains her minds in a faltering voice. Plutocracy is a selfish government controlled by the wealthy, but national socialism is a selfless government. A good Nazi works for the good of the fatherland, not for self-interest and self-gain. A good Nazi is a good soldier for the fatherland, one who can lead as well as follow. For a brief second, their eyes meet, and in that brief second, Helmuth sees a flicker in his teacher's eyes. Helmuth wonders if Herr Mines believes his own words about national socialism. This paper was written by a student advanced in his years, continues Herr Mines. He returns Helmuth's paper to the stack and sets the stack on his desk. These papers will become a part of your permanent record, he says. Herr Mines glances up at the clock. Helmuth, please remain. The rest of you are dismissed. Heil Hitler. Helmuth wonders what his teacher wants as a, his classmates rush for the door. Perhaps Herr Mines has thought, like Helmuth, Thoughts he cannot dare to write. Perhaps that is what Herr Mines wants to tell him. Helmuth's hands tremble with anticipation. The room is empty, quiet. Herr Mines sits in a student desk next to Helmuth, folds his hands on his lap. You will go far, he says to Helmuth. Your essay shows that a leader can lead with words as well as action. Then he adds softly, but in class your idealism shows as well. Be careful of idealism, my boy, for idealism is the most dangerous doctrine of all. And there it is again, the flicker. Helmuth nurses a desire to blurt out the truth that his paper is a lie, that it turned his stomach to write it, and that he will never write such lies again now that he has earned his Oberbau diploma. He senses that Herr Mines would understand, but then the flicker is snuffed out and in its place hardness, and so Helmuth says, I will go far. Just you wait and see. Someday you will hear something great about me. Helmuth graduates and May finds him working at the Bieber House, the social welfare department at the City Hall. It is a coveted apprenticeship, one awarded to those who excel in school and are expected to move into important government positions. Hugo is proud. With your head, the government can use you, Hugo tells him. Soon, Helmuth knows his way around the administrative offices, and one morning he is sent to file papers in a basement storeroom. He swings open the storeroom door and gropes for the light switch. The single overhead bulb floods the room, and he blinks in amazement. From floor to ceiling, he sees books, rows and rows of books. In amazement, he trails his finger across the dusty spines, reads the names of forbidden authors such as Thomas Mann and his brother Heinrich Mann, the Jewish writer Heinrich Hein, the author Eric Maria Renmark, the, philosophy, the philosopher Karl Marx, the American author Jack London, and more. Helmuth feels stunned. He thought these books had all been burned eight years earlier, but here they are, in the dusty storeroom beneath City Hall. He plucks a book from the shelf. Geist und Tat, Spirit and Action, by Heinrich Mann, who criticized Germany's growing fascism so loudly that he was forced to flee after Hitler became chancellor. Helmuth hesitates. He knows the risk reading such a book would pose. It could get him fired, or worse, cause serious trouble for his family. He starts to wedge the book back into its place, but stops, holds it in both hands, as if weighing it. Why are the Nazis so afraid of words? What don't they want him to know? Helmuth can't explain it, but reading that book feels necessary, as necessary as breath. He won't be caught, not if he's careful. Helmuth slips the book beneath his shirt, shuts off the desk light, eases the door closed, returns upstairs to his desk. Helmuth glances at the other apprentices, Gerhard Dewar, Werner Krantz, and at his boss, Heinrich Mons, who is at the office of Beitrib Sobman. It's Herr Mons's job to ensure that all employees are loyal Nazis. They are all bent busily over their desks. Helmuth's heart beats wildly as he sits at his desk and slides the book from his shirt into his satchel. No one suspects a thing. Several nights later, Oma and Opa are sitting on the couch listening to the RRG when Rudy visits after supper. Helmuth beckons him into his bedroom and closes the door. He reaches beneath his mattress, takes out the Heinrich Mann book, and shows him... <gasps> Heinrich Mann, where did you get that? whispers Rudy. At work, 
Alma says in an excited whisper. There's a whole storeroom filled with forbidden books, rows and rows of them. Rudy backs away. <clears throat> You're crazy, he says. Do you know how much trouble you can get in if the Gestapo catch you stealing books? I didn't steal it, Helmuth says. I borrowed it. And the Gestapo have better things to do than catch me. Helmuth thumbs through the Geist und Tat, stops at a page he has lightly outlined with pencil. Listen to this. Heinrich Mann says that revolutions are rare because people are too selfish. They think only of themselves. Rudy looks at Helmuth incredulously. You want to start a revolution? Think about it. If more Germans spoke out, leaders like Hitler wouldn't be allowed to lie and say, I want peace, and then start a war. Helmuth jabs at the page with his forefinger. The French knew how to overthrow oppression and tyranny. We could learn a lot from the French. Helmuth, Rudy says shocked. You could get arrested for saying those things. Helmuth continues to flip through the book. Just look at the French Revolution. Look at their motto. Equality, liberty, fraternity, that was their battle cry. Those are the things we've given up that the Nazis have taken from us. Rudy's face folds into worry. What is it that you want, Helmuth? Helmuth sits, closes his eyes, takes a deep breath, feels a warm calm fill him, and suddenly he knows. He opens his eyes. Geist und Tat, he says. Spirit and action. That is what Helmuth wants.